Hey guys, today I'll be reading A Temporary Matter by Jhumpa Lahiri from, the, from her collection, The Interpreter of Maladies. This is an audio recording read by me, Jordan Barclay, because I want to. Alright, let's dive in. A Temporary Matter. The notice informed them that it was a temporary matter. For five days, their electricity would be cut off for one hour, beginning at 8 p.m., a line had gone down in the last snowstorm, and the repairmen were going to take advantage of the milder evenings to set it right. The work would affect only the houses on the quiet tree-lined street, within walking distance of a row of brick-faced stores and a trolley stop, where Shoba and Shukumar had lived for three years. It's good of them to warn us, Shoba conceded after reading the notice aloud, more of her own benefit than Shukumar's. She let the strap of the leather satchel, plump with flies, slip from her shoulders, and left it in the hallway as she walked into the kitchen. She wore a navy blue poplin raincoat over gray sweatpants and white sneakers, looking, at 33, like the type of woman she'd once claimed she would never resemble. She'd come from the gym. Her cranberry lipstick was visible only on the outer reaches of her mouth and her eyeliner had left charcoal patches beneath her lower ashes. She used to look this way sometimes, Shukumar thought, on mornings after a party or a night at a bar, when she'd been too lazy to wash her face, too eager to collapse into his arms. She dropped a sheaf of mail on the table without a glance. Her eyes were still fixed on the notice in her other hand. But they should do this sort of thing during the day, when I'm here, you mean, Shukumar said. He put a glass lid on a pot of lamb, adjusting it so only the slightest bit of steam could escape. Since January, he'd been working at home, trying to complete the final chapters of his dissertation on agrarian revolts in India. When do the repairs start? It says March 19th. Is today the 19th? Shoba walked over to the framed cork board that hung on the wall by the fridge, bare except for a calendar of William Morris wallpaper patterns. She looked at it as if for the first time, studying the wallpaper pattern carefully on the top half before allowing her eyes to fall to the numbered grid on the bottom. A friend had sent the calendar in the mail as a Christmas gift, even though Shoba and Shukumar hadn't celebrated Christmas that year. Today, then. Shoba announced. You have a dentist appointment next Friday, by the way. He ran his tongue over the tops of his teeth. He'd forgotten to brush them that morning. It wasn't the first time. He hadn't left the house at all that day, or the day before. The more Shoba stayed out, the more she began putting in extra hours at work and taking on additional projects. The more he wanted to stay in, not even leaving to get the mail, or to buy fruit or wine at the stores by the trolley stop. Six months ago, in September, Shukumar was at an academic conference in Baltimore when Shoba went into labor. Three weeks before her due date, he hadn't wanted to go to the conference, but she had insisted. It was important to make contacts, and he would be entering the job market next year. She told him that she had his number at the hotel, and a copy of his schedule and flight numbers and she had arranged with her friend Gillian for a ride to the hospital in the event of an emergency. When the cab pulled away that morning for the airport, Shoba stood waving goodbye in her robe, with one arm resting on the mound of her belly as if it were a perfectly natural part of her body. Each time he thought of that moment, the last moment he saw Shoba pregnant, it was the cab he remembered most. A station wagon, painted red with blue lettering. It was cavernous compared to their own car. Although Shukumar was six feet tall, with hands too big ever to rest comfortably in the pocket of his jeans, he felt dwarfed in the back seat. As the cab sped down Beacon Street, he imagined a day when he and Shoba might need to buy a station wagon of their own to cart their children back and forth from music lessons and dentist appointments. He imagined himself gripping the wheel, as Shoba turned around to hand the children juice boxes. Once, these images of parenthood had troubled Shukumar, 
adding to his anxiety that he was still a student at 35. But that early autumn morning, the trees still heavy with bronze leaves, he welcomed the image for the first time. A member of the staff had found him somehow among the identical convention rooms and handed him a stiff square of stationery. It was only a telephone number, but Shukumar knew it was the hospital. When he returned to Boston, it was over. The baby had been born dead. Shoba was lying on a bed, asleep, in a private room so small there was barely enough space to stand beside her. In a wing of the hospital they hadn't been to on the tour for expectant parents. Her placenta had weakened, and she'd had a cesarean, though not quickly enough. The doctor explained that these things happen. He smiled in the kindest way it was possible to smile at people known only professionally. Shoba would be back on her feet in a few weeks. There was nothing to indicate that she would not be able to have children in the future. These days, Shoba was always gone by the time Shukumar woke up. He would open his eyes and see the long black hairs she shed on her pillow and think of her, dressed, sipping her third cup of coffee already, in her office downtown, where she searched for typographical errors in textbooks and marked them, in a code she had once explained to him with an assortment of colored pencils. She would do the same for his dissertation, she promised, when it was ready. He envied the specificity of her task, so unlike the elusive nature of his. He was a mediocre student who had a facility for absorbing details without curiosity. Until September, he had been diligent if not dedicated, summarizing chapters, outlining arguments on pads of yellow-lined paper. But now, he would lie in their bed until he grew bored gazing at his side of the closet, which Shoba always left partly open. At the row of tweed jackets and corduroy trousers, he would not have to choose from to teach his classes that semester. After the baby died, it was too late to withdraw from his teaching duties, but his advisor had arranged things so that he had the spring semester to himself. Shukumar was in his sixth year of graduate school. That and the summer should give you a good push his advisor had said. You should be able to wrap things up by next September. But nothing was pushing Shukumar. Instead, he thought of how he and Shoba had become experts at avoiding each other in their three-bedroom house, spending as much time on separate floors as possible. He thought of how he had no longer looked forward to weekends, when she sat for hours on the sofa with her colored pencils and her files, so that he feared that putting on a record in his own house might be rude. He thought of how long it had been since she looked into his eyes and smiled, or whispered his name on those rare occasions they still reached for each other's bodies before sleeping. In the beginning, he had believed that it would pass, that he and Shoba would get through it all somehow. She was only thirty-three. She was strong, on her feet again. But it wasn't a consolation. It was often nearly lunchtime when Shukumar would finally pull himself out of bed and head downstairs to the coffee pot, pouring out the extra bit Shoba left for him, along with an empty mug, on the countertop. Shukumar gathered onion skins in his hands and let them drop into the garbage pail, on the top of the ribbons of fat he'd trimmed from the lamb. He ran the water in the sink, soaking the knife and cutting boards and rubbed a lemon half along his fingertips to get rid of the garlic smell, a trick he'd learned from Shoba. It was 7.30. Through the window he saw the sky, like soft black pitch. Uneven banks of snow still lined the sidewalks, though it was warm enough for people to walk about without hats or gloves. Nearly three feet had fallen in the last storm, so that for a week people had to walk single file, in narrow trenches. For a week, that was Shukumar's excuse for not leaving the house. But now the trenches were widening, and water drained steadily into the grates into the pavement. The lamb won't be done by eight, Shukumar said. We may have to eat in the dark. We can light candles, Shoba suggested. She unclipped her hair, coiled neatly at her nape during the days, and pried the speakers from her feet without untying them. 
I'm going to shower before the lights go, she said, heading for the staircase. I'll be down. Shukumar moved her satchel and her sneakers to the side of the fridge. She wasn't this way before. She used to put her coat on a hanger, her sneakers in the closet, and she paid bills as soon as they came. But now she treated the house as if it were a hotel. The fact that the yellow chintz armchair in the living room clashed with the blue and maroon Turkish carpet no longer bothered her. On the enclosed porch at the back of the house, a crisp white bag still sat on the wicker chase, filled with lace she had once planned to turn into curtains. While Shoba showered, Shukumar went into the downstairs bathroom and found a new toothbrush in its box beneath the sink. The cheap, stiff bristles hurt his gums, and he spit some blood into the basin. The spare brush was one of the many stored into her metal basket. Shoba had bought them once when they were on sale, in the event that a visitor decided, at the last minute, to spend the night. It was typical of her. She was the type to prepare for surprises, good and bad. If she found a skirt or a purse she liked, she bought two. She kept the bonuses from her job in a separate bank account in her name. It hadn't bothered him. His own mother had fallen to pieces when his father died, abandoning the house he grew up in and moving back to Calcutta, leaving Shukumar to settle it all. He liked that Shobo was different. It astonished him, her capacity to think ahead. When she used to do the shopping, the pantry was always stocked with extra bottles of olive and corn oil, depending on whether they were cooking Italian or Indian. There were countless boxes of pasta in all shapes and colors, zippered sacks of basmati rice, whole sides of lambs and goats from the Muslim butchers at Haymarket, chopped up and frozen in countless plastic bags. Every other Saturday, they wound through the maze of stalls Shukumar eventually knew by heart. He watched in disbelief as she bought more food, trailed behind her with canvas bags as she pushed through the crowd, arguing under the morning sun with boys too young to shave but already missing teeth, who twisted up brown paper bags of artichokes, plums, ginger root, and yams, and dropped them on their scales, and tossed them to Shobo one by one, she didn't mind being jostled, even when she was pregnant. She was tall and broad-shouldered, with hips that her obstetrician assured her were made for childbearing. During the drive back home, as the car curved along the trolls, they invariably marveled at how much food they bought. It never went to waste. When friends dropped by, Shoba would throw together meals that appeared to have taken half a day to prepare from things she had frozen and bottled, not cheap things in tins, but peppers she had marinated herself with rosemary and chutneys that she cooked on Saturdays, stirring boiling pots of tomatoes and prunes. Her labeled mason jars lined the shelves of the kitchen, in sealed pyramids enough, they'd agreed, to last for their grandchildren to taste. They'd eaten it all by now. Shukumai had been going through their supplies steadily, preparing meals for the two of them, measuring out cupfuls of rice, defrosting bags of meat day after day. He combined through her cookbooks every afternoon, following her penciled instructions to use two teaspoons of ground coriander seeds instead of one, or red lentils instead of yellow. Each of the recipes was dated, telling the first time they had eaten the dish together. April 2nd, cauliflowers with fennel. January 14th, chicken with almonds and sultanas. He had no memory of eating those meals, and yet there they were, recorded in her neat proofreader's hand. Shukumar enjoyed cooking now. It was the one thing that made him feel productive. If it weren't for him, he knew Shoba would eat a bowl of cereal for her dinner. Tonight, with no lights, they would have to eat together. For months now they served themselves from the stove, and he'd taken his plate into his study, letting the meal grow cold on his desk before shoving it into his mouth without pause. While Shoba took her plate to the living room and watched game shows, or proofread files with her arsenal of colored pencils at hand. 
At some point in the evening, she visited him. When he heard her approach, he would put away his novel and begin typing sentences. She would rest her hands on his shoulders and stare with him into the blue glow of the computer screen. Don't work too hard, she would say after a minute or two, and head off to bed. It was the one time in the day she sought him out, and yet he'd come to dread it. He knew it was something she forced herself to do. She would look around the walls of the room, which they had decorated together last summer with a border of marching ducks and rabbits playing trumpets with drums. By the end of August, there was a cherry crib under the window, a white changing table with mint green knobs, and a rocking chair with checkered cushions. Shikamar had disassembled it all before bringing Shoba back from the hospital, scraping off the rabbits and ducks with a spatula. For some reason, the room did not haunt him the way it haunted Shoba. In January, when he stopped working at his corral in the library, he set up his desk there deliberately, partly because the room soothed him, and partly because it was a place Shoba avoided. Shukumar returned to the kitchen and began to open drawers. He tried to locate a candle among the scissors, the egg beaters and whisks, the mortar and pestle she'd bought in a bazaar in Calcutta, and used to pound garlic cloves and cardamom pods back when she used to cook. He found a flashlight, but no batteries, and a half-empty box of birthday candles. Shoba had thrown him a surprise birthday party last May. 120 people had crammed into the house, all the friends and the friends of friends they now systematically avoided. Bottles of Vinho Verde had nested in a bed of ice in the bathtub. Shoba was in her fifth month, drinking ginger ale from a martini glass. She had made a vanilla cream cake with custard and spun sugar. All night she kept Shikamar's long fingers linked with hers as they walked among the guests at the party. Since September, their only guest had been Shoba's mother. She came from Arizona and stayed with them for two months after Shobo returned from the hospital. She cooked dinner every night, drove herself to the supermarket, washed their clothes, put them away. She was a religious woman. She set up a small shrine, a framed picture of a lavender-faced goddess and a plate of marigold petals on the bedside table in the guest room and prayed twice a day for healthy grandchildren in the future. She was polite to Shikamoy without being friendly. She folded his sweaters with an expertise she had learned from a job in a department store. She replaced a missing button on his winter coat and knit him a beige and brown scarf, presenting it to him without the least bit of ceremony, as if he had only dropped it and hadn't noticed. She never talked to him about Shoba. Once, when he mentioned the baby's death, she looked up from her knitting and said, but you weren't even there. It struck him as odd that there were no real candles in the house, that Shoba hadn't prepared for such an ordinary emergency. He looked now for something to put the birthday candles in and settled on the soil of a potted ivy that normally sat on the windowsill over the sink. Even though the plant was inches from the tap, the soil was so dry that he had to water it first before candles would stand straight. He pushed aside the things on the kitchen table, the piles of mail, the unread library books. He remembered their first meals there, when they were so thrilled to be married, to be living together in the same house at last, that they would just reach for each other foolishly, more eager to make love than to eat. He put down two embroidered placemats, a wedding gift from an uncle in Lucknow, and set out the plates and wine glasses they usually saved for guests. He put the ivy in the middle, the white-edged, star-shaped leaves girded by ten little candles. He switched on the digital clock radio and turned it to a jazz station. What's all this? Shoba said when she came downstairs. Her hair was wrapped in a thick white towel. She undid the towel and draped it over her chair, allowing her hair, damp and dark, to fall across her back. As she walked absently toward the stove, she took out a few tangles with her fingers. She wore a clean pair of sweatpants, a t-shirt, an old flannel robe. Her stomach was flat again, her waist narrow before the flare of her lips. 
the belt of the robe tied in a floppy knot. It was nearly eight. Shukumai put the rice on the table and the lentils from the night before into the microwave oven, punching the numbers on the timer. You made Rogan Josh, Shoba observed, looking through the glass lid at the bright paprika stew. Shukumai took out a piece of lamb, pinching it quickly between his fingers so as to not scald himself. He prodded a large piece with a serving spoon to make sure the meat slid easily from the bone. It's ready, he announced. The microwave had just beeped when the lights went out, and the music disappeared. Perfect timing, Shoba said. All I could find were birthday candles. He lit up the ivy, keeping the rest of the candles and a book of matches by his plate. It doesn't matter, she said, running a finger along the stem of her wine glass. It looks lovely. In the dimness, he knew how she sat, a bit forward in her chair, ankles crossed against the lowest rung, left elbow on the table. During his search for the candles, Shukumar had found a bottle of wine in a crate he had thought was empty. He clamped the bottle between his knees while he turned in the corkscrew. He worried about spilling, and so he picked up the glasses and held them close to his lap while he filled them. They served themselves, stirring the rice with their forks, squinting as they extracted bay leaves and cloves from the stew. Every few minutes, Shukumai lit a few more birthday candles and drove them into the soil of the pot. It's like India, Shoba said, watching him tend his makeshift candelabra. Sometimes the current disappears for hours at a stretch. I once had to attend an entire rice ceremony in the dark. The baby just cried and cried. It must have been so hot. The baby had never cried, Shukumai considered. The baby would never have a rice ceremony, even though Shoba had already made the guest list and decided on which of her three brothers she was going to ask to feed the child its first taste of solid food. At six months if it was a boy, seven if it was a girl. Are you hot? he asked her. He pushed the blazing ivy pot to the other end of the table, closer to the piles of books and mail, making it even more difficult for them to see each other. He was suddenly irritated that he couldn't go upstairs and sit in front of the computer. No, it's delicious, she said, tapping her plate with her fork. It really is. He refilled the wine in her glass. She thanked him. They weren't like this before. Now he had to struggle to say something that interested her, something that made her look up from her plate or from her proofreading files. Eventually, he gave up trying to amuse her. He learned not to mind the silences. I remember during power failures at my grandmother's house. We all had to say something, Shoba continued. He could barely see her face. But from the tone, he knew her eyes were narrowed, as if trying to focus on a distant subject. It was a habit of hers. Like what? I don't know. A little poem? A joke? A fact about the world? For some reason, my relatives always wanted me to tell them the names of my friends in America. I don't know why the information was so interesting to them. The last time I saw my aunt, she asked after four girls I went to elementary school with in Tucson. I barely remember them now. Shukumar hadn't spent much time in India as Shoba had. His parents, who settled in New Hampshire, used to go back without him. The first time he'd gone as an infant, he'd nearly died of amoebic dysentery. His father, a nervous type, was afraid to take him again, in case something were to happen, and left him with his aunt and uncle in Concord. As a teenager, he preferred sailing camp or scooping ice cream during the summers to going to Calcutta. It wasn't until after his father died, in the last year of college, that the country began to interest him, and he studied its history from the course books as if it were any other subject. He wished now that he had his own childhood story of India. Let's do that, she said suddenly. Do what? Say something to each other in the dark. Like what? I don't know any jokes. No, no jokes, she thought for a minute. 
How about telling each other something we've never told before? I used to play this game in high school, Shukamaru recalled, when I got drunk. You're thinking of truth and dare. This is different. Okay, I'll start. She took a sip of wine. The first time I was alone in your apartment, I looked in your address book to see if you'd written me in. I think we'd known each other for two weeks. Where was I? You went to answer the telephone in the other room. It was your mother, and I figured it would be a long call. I wanted to know if you promoted me from the margins of your newspaper. Had I? No, but I didn't give up on you. Now it's your turn. He couldn't think of anything, but Shobo was waiting for him to speak. She hadn't appeared so determined in months. What was there left to say to her? He thought back to their first meeting, four years earlier at a lecture hall in Cambridge, where a group of Bengali poets were giving a recital. They ended up side by side, on folding wooden chairs. Shukumar was soon bored. He was unable to decipher the literary diction, and couldn't join the rest of the audience as they sighed and nodded solemnly after certain phrases. Peering at the newspaper folded in his lap, he studied the temperatures of cities around the world. 91 degrees in Singapore yesterday, 51 in Stockholm. When he turned his head to the left, he saw a woman next to him making a grocery list of the back of a folder, and was startled to find that she was beautiful. Okay, he said, remembering. The first time we went out to dinner, to the Portuguese place, I forgot to tip the waiter. I went back the next morning, found out his name, left money with the manager. You went all the way back to Somerville just to tip a waiter? I took a cab. Why did you forget to tip the waiter? The birthday candles had burned out, but he pictured her face clearly in the dark, the wide, tilting eyes, the full, grape-toned lips, the fall at age two from her high chair still visible as a comma on her chin. Each day, Shukumar noticed. Her beauty, which had once overwhelmed him, seemed to fade. The cosmetics that had seemed superfluous were necessary now, not to improve her, but to define her somehow. By the end of the meal, I had a funny feeling that I might marry you, he said, admitting it to himself as well as to her for the first time. It must have distracted me. The next night, Shoba came home earlier than usual. There was lamb left over from the evening before and Shukumar heated it up so that they were able to eat by seven. He'd gone out that day, through the melting snow, and bought a packet of taper candles from the corner store, and batteries to fit the flashlight. He had the candles ready on the countertop, standing in brass holders shaped like lotuses. But they ate under the glow of the copper-shaded ceiling lamp that hung over the table. When they had finished eating, Shukumar was surprised to see that Shoba was stacking her plate on top of his, and then carrying them over to the sink. He had assumed she would retreat to the living room, behind her barricade of files. Don't worry about the dishes, he said, taking them from her hands. It seems silly not to, she replied, pouring a drop of detergent onto a sponge. It's nearly eight o'clock. His heart quickened. All day Shukumar had looked forward to the lights going out. He thought about what Shoba had said the night before, about looking in his address book. It felt good to remember her as she was then. How bold yet nervous she'd been when they first met. How hopeful. They stood side by side at the sink, their reflections fitting together in the frame of the window. It made him shy, the way he felt the first time they stood together in a mirror. He couldn't recall the last time they'd been photographed. They had stopped attending parties, went nowhere together. The film in his camera still contained pictures of Shoba, in the yard, when she was pregnant. After finishing the dishes, they leaned against the counter, drying their hands on either end of a towel. At eight o'clock the house went black. Shukumar lit the wicks of the candles, impressed by their long, steady flames. Let's sit outside, Shoba said. I think it's warm still. 
They each took a candle and sat down on the steps. It seemed strange to be sitting outside with patches of snow still on the ground. But everyone is out of their house tonight. The air fresh enough to make people restless. Screen doors opened and closed. A small parade of neighbors passed by with flashlights. We're going to the bookstore to browse, a silver-haired man called out. He was walking with his wife, a thin woman in a windbreaker, and holding a dog on the leash. They were the Bradfords, and they had tucked a sympathy card into Shoba and Shukumar's mailbox back in September. I hear they've got their power. They'd better, Shukumar said, or you'll be browsing in the dark. The woman laughed, slipping her arm through the crook of her husband's elbow. Want to join us? No, thanks. Shoba and Shukumar called out together. It surprised Shukumar that his words matched hers. He wondered what Shoba would tell him in the dark. The worst possibilities had already run through his head. That she'd had an affair. That she didn't respect him for being 35 and still a student. That she blamed him for being in Baltimore the way her mother did. But he knew those things weren't true. She'd been faithful, as had he. She believed in him. It was she who had insisted he go to Baltimore. What didn't they know about each other? He knew she curled her fingers tightly when she slept, that her body twitched during bad dreams. He knew it was honeydew she favored over cantaloupe. He knew that when they returned from the hospital, the first thing she did when she walked into the house was pick out objects of theirs and toss them into a pile in the hallway. Books from the shelves, plants from the windowsills, Paintings from walls, photos from tables, pots from pans that hung from hooks over the stove. Shukumar had stepped out of her way, watching as she moved methodically from room to room. When she was satisfied, she stood there staring at the pile she'd made, her lips drawn back in such distaste that Shukumar had thought she would spit. Then she'd started to cry. He began to feel cold as he sat there on the steps. He felt that he needed her to talk first, in order to reciprocate. That time when your mother came to visit us, she said finally. When I said one night that I had to stay late at work, I went out with Gillian and had a martini. He looked at her profile, the slender nose, the slightly masculine set of her jaw. He remembered that night well, eating with his mother tired from teaching two classes back to back, wishing Shoba were there to say more of the right things because he came up with only the wrong ones. It had been twelve years since his father had died, and his mother had come to spend two weeks with him in Shoba, so they could honor his father's memory together. Each night his mother cooked something his father had liked, but she was too upset to eat the dishes herself, and her eyes would well up as Shoba stroked her hand. It's so touching, Shoba had said to him at the time. Now he pictured Shoba with Gillian, in a bar with striped velvet sofas, the one they used to go to after the movies, making sure he got her extra olive, asking Gillian for his cigarette. He imagined her complaining, and Gillian sympathizing about visits from in-laws. It was Gillian who had driven Shoba to the hospital. Your turn, she said stopping his thoughts. At the end of their street, Shukumar heard sounds of a drill and the electricians shouting over it. He looked at the darkened facades of the houses lining the street. Candles glowed in the windows of one. In spite of the warmth, smoke rose from the chimney. I cheated on my oriental civilization exam in college, he said. It was my last semester, my last set of exams. My father had died a few months before. I could see the blue book of the guy next to me. He was an American guy, a maniac. He knew Urdu and Sanskrit. I couldn't remember if the verse we had to identify was an example of a ghazal or not. I looked at his answer and copied it down. It had happened over 15 years ago. He felt relief now, having told her. She turned to him, looking not at his face but at his shoes, old moccasins he wore as if they were slippers. 
the leather at the back permanently flattened. He wondered if it bothered her, what he'd said. She took his hand and pressed it. You didn't have to tell me why you did it, she said, moving closer to him. They sat together until nine o'clock. When the lights came on, they heard some people across the street clapping from their porch and televisions being turned on. The Bradfords walked back down the street, eating ice cream cones and waving. Shoba and Shukamoy waved back. Then they stood up, his stand still in hers, and went inside. Somehow, without saying anything, it had turned into this, into an exchange of confessions, the little ways they'd hurt or disappointed each other, and themselves. The following day, Shukamar thought for hours about what to say to her. He was torn between admitting that he once ripped out a photo of a woman in one of the fashion magazines she used to subscribe to and carried it in his books for a week, or saying that he really hadn't lost the sweater vest she brought him for their third wedding anniversary, but had exchanged it for cash at Fellini's, and that he had gotten drunk alone in the middle of the day at a hotel bar. For their first anniversary, Shoba had cooked a ten-course dinner just for him. The vest depressed him. My wife gave me a sweater vest for our anniversary, he complained to the bartender, his head heavy with cognac. What do you expect? The bartender had replied. You're married. As for the picture of the woman, he didn't know why he'd ripped it out. She wasn't as pretty as Shoba. She wore a white sequined dress and had a sullen face and lean, mannish legs. Her bare arms were raised, her fists around her head, as if she were about to punch herself in the ears. It was an advertisement for stockings. Shoba had been pregnant at the time, her stomach suddenly immense, to the point where Shukumar no longer wanted to touch her. The first time he saw the picture, he was lying in bed next to her, watching her as she read. When he noticed the magazine in the recycling pile, he found the woman and tore out the page as carefully as he could. For about a week, he allowed himself a glimpse each day. He felt an intense desire for the woman, but it was a desire that turned to disgust after a minute or two. It was the closest he'd come to infidelity. He told Shoba about the sweater on the third night, the picture on the fourth. She said nothing as he spoke expressed no protest or reproach. She simply listened, and then she took his hand, pressing it as she had before. On the third night, she told him that once after a lecture they'd attended, she let him speak to the chairman of his department without telling them that he had a dab of pate on his chin. She'd been irritated with him for some reason, and so she let him go on and on about securing his fellowship for the following semester, without putting a finger to her own chin as a signal. The fourth night, she said that she never liked the one poem he'd ever published in his life, in a literary magazine in Utah. He'd written the poem after meeting Shoba. She added that she found the poem sentimental. Nothing happened when the house was dark. They were able to talk to each other again. The third night after supper, they sat together on the sofa. And once it was the dark, he began kissing her awkwardly on the forehead and her face. And though it was dark, he closed his eyes, and knew that she did, too. The fourth night, they walked carefully upstairs, to bed, feeling together for the final step with their feet before the landing, and making love with the desperation they had forgotten. She wept without sound, and whispered his name, and traced his eyebrows with her finger in the dark. As he made love to her, he wondered what he would say to her the next night, and what she would say. The thought of it exciting him. Hold me, he said. Hold me in your arms. By the time the lights came back on downstairs, they'd fallen asleep. The morning of the fifth night, Shukumai found another notice from the electric company in the mailbox. The line had been repaired ahead of schedule, it said. He was disappointed. He had planned on making shrimp malai for Shoba. But when he arrived at the store, he didn't feel like cooking anymore. It wasn't the same, he thought, knowing that the lights wouldn't go out. In the store, the shrimp looked gray and thin. The coconut milk tin was dusty and overpriced. Still, he bought them, 
along with a beeswax candle and two bottles of wine. She came home at 7.30. I suppose this is the end of our game, he said when he saw her reading the notice. She looked at him. You can still light the candles if you want. She hadn't been to the gym tonight. She wore a suit beneath the raincoat. Her makeup had been retouched recently. When she went upstairs to change, Shukumar poured himself some wine and put on a record, a Thelonious Monk album he knew she liked. When she came downstairs, they ate together. She didn't thank him or compliment him. They simply ate in a darkened room, in the glow of a beeswax candle. They had survived a difficult time. They finished off the shrimp. They finished off the first bottle of wine and moved on to the second. They sat together until the candle had nearly burned away. She shifted in her chair, and Shukumar thought that she was about to say something. But instead she blew out the candle, stood up, turned on the light switch, and sat down again. Shouldn't we keep the lights off? Shukumar asked. She set her plate aside and clasped her hands on the table. I want you to see my face when I tell you this, she said gently. His heart began to pound. The day she told him she was pregnant, she had used the very same words, saying them in the same gentle way, turning off the basketball game he'd been watching on television. He hadn't been prepared then. Now he was. Only he didn't want her to be pregnant again. He didn't want to have to pretend to be happy. I've been looking for an apartment, and I found one, she said, narrowing her eyes on something. It seemed behind his left shoulder. It was nobody's fault, she continued. She'd been through enough. She needed some time alone. She had money saved up for a security deposit. The apartment was on Beacon Hill, so she could walk to work. She had signed the lease that night before coming home. She wouldn't look at him but he stared at her. It was obvious that she'd rehearsed the lines. All this time, she'd been looking for an apartment, testing the water pressure, asking a realtor if heat and hot water were included in the rent. It sickened Shukumar, knowing that she had spent these past evenings preparing a life without him. He was relieved, and yet he was sickened. This was what she'd been trying to tell him for the past four evenings. This was the point of her game. Now it was his turn to speak. There was something he'd sworn he would never tell her, and for six months he had done his best to block it from his mind. Before the ultrasound, she had asked the doctor not to tell her the sex of their child, and Shukumar had agreed. She wanted it to be a surprise. Later, those few times they talked about what had happened, she said at least they'd been spared that knowledge. In a way, she almost took pride in her decision, for it enabled her to seek refuge in a mystery. He knew that she assumed it was a mystery for him, too. He'd arrived too late from Baltimore, when it was all over and she was lying on the hospital bed. But he hadn't. He'd arrived early enough to see their baby, and to hold him before they cremated him. At first, he had recoiled at the suggestion but the doctor said holding the baby might help him with the process of grieving. Shoba was asleep. The baby had been cleaned off. His bulbous lids shut tight to the world. Our baby was a boy, he said. His skin was more red than brown. He had black hair on his head. He weighed almost five pounds. His fingers were curled shut just like yours in the night. Shoba looked at him now, her face contorted with sorrow. He had cheated on a college exam, ripped a picture of a woman out of a magazine. He had returned a sweater and got drunk in the middle of the day instead. These were the things he had told her. He had held his son, who had known life only within her against his chest in a darkened room in an unknown wing of the hospital. He had held him until a nurse knocked and took him away, and he promised himself that day that he would never tell Shoba, because he still loved her then, 
and it was the one thing in her life that she had wanted to be a surprise. Shukumar stood up and stacked his plate on top of hers. He carried the plates to the sink, but instead of running the tap, he looked out the window. Outside the evening was still warm, and the Bradfords were still walking arm in arm. As he watched the couple, the room went dark, and he spun around. Shoba had turned the lights off. She came back to the table and sat down. And after a moment, Shukumar joined her. They wept together for the things they now knew. End of a Temporary Matter Written by Jhumpa Lahiri If you enjoyed the production of this audio, be sure to give it a like. If you have any requests on what I should read next, feel free to comment below, and I'll see if I can get to it. And if you want to be updated on daily and weekly audio recordings, hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. Alright guys, I'll see you later. I'm out. Peace.